You've probably heard the expression, it's a small world before. But what exactly does a small world mean? Well, to answer this question, I'm very delighted to have my student Cloda on the channel, who has a lovely video for you answering that very question. Take it away. So, as Trevor was saying, there's actually a way to quantify how small the world really is. So before we kind of look into that, let's just start by looking at the people that you know. You're all connected to them, but chances are several of them are connected to each other. So in the real world, we would call this a clique. In math, we do too. Except in math, it means that for every two people, there is guaranteed to be a connection between them. There's a couple of other interesting things about small world graphs. One of them is hubs, which you might be familiar with because of cities. But while we can just look at cities, we can also look at the flight paths between them. Here, it's pretty easy to see where the hubs are. There's one more thing that sets a small world graph apart. This is that it has a high clustering coefficient. The clustering coefficient measures how much vertices, or these, tend to cluster together. We'll start by looking at the local clustering coefficient. The local clustering coefficient focuses on one vertex, and it quantifies how close its neighbors are to being a clique. In this case, the vertex has three neighbors. So, Let's look at how we calculate the local clustering coefficient, or CL. We calculate it by dividing the number of links between the neighbors by the number of possible links that could occur between them. When we say links, this is what we're talking about. Now let's look at some examples. Firstly, we can look at what happens if there's no connection between the neighbors, which is what you can see here with the dotted pink lines. So in this case, we would divide 0 by 3, which is just going to be a clustering coefficient of 0. What if there's one connection between the neighbors? Well, in this case, it's pretty easy. The local clustering coefficient is just going to be one third. Well, what if there's connections between all of the neighbors? In this case, we have a local clustering coefficient of one, which is the highest that it could possibly be. This helps to explain if a group of neighbors is a clique or not. But how do we look at the overall clustering of the graph? For this, we look at the global clustering coefficient. The global clustering coefficient is based on the concept of triplets of vertices. Here, you can see we have an open triplet or we have a closed triplet, which we also just call a triangle. But this is a little bit complicated to just think about, so we should probably look at it in action. The way that we calculate the global clustering coefficient is by taking 3 multiplied by the number of triangles in the graph divided by the number of all triplets in the graph. Let's look at an example because it's a little bit confusing to think of. So let's take this example. We'll work our way through it, first counting the triangles and then counting the triplets. To start, we've got first triangle, the second triangle, and the third triangle. So we've got three in total. But what about the triplets? So let's just start by looking at this triangle right here. This triangle has three different vertices, which the three different vertices can have three different combinations and orders that would make up three different triplets. So each triangle contains three triplets. So we've got that for our first triangle, now we've got it for our second triangle, and we've got it for our third triangle. So we've got nine in total. But what about the triplets that aren't a part of these triangles? Well, we've got five of those. So we've got 14 triplets and three triangles. Putting that together, we have nine over 14, or 0.64 as our clustering coefficient. But how do we tell if our graph is a small world graph? To do this, we compare it against a random graph. So I'm going to be showing a bunch of different random graphs so you can get a good feel for what they are, which all of these were generated through the erdos ringi model that generates all of these different types of graphs. But how do we choose which random graph to compare our suspected small world graph against? To do this, we choose a random graph that has an equivalent density as our small world graph. But what is density? We take 2 and we multiply it by the number of edges in the graph divided by the number of vertices times the number of vertices minus 1. So if you're still wondering what density is, we can look at these two graphs as an example. We can clearly see which one is denser here. We can also do an example to clarify this further. Here in this small graph, we've got 5 edges and 4 vertices, so we can calculate this pretty easily. We've got 2 times 5 divided by 4 times 3, so 10 divided by 12, which is just 0 0.833. So density is really just a measure of how many edges are between all of the vertices in a graph. The more edges, the higher the density. Well, this is all interesting, but how do we actually compare it? We've chosen our random graph with an equivalent density, but what do we do now? So in order to compare the graphs, 
we are going to use the clustering coefficient, which we know how to calculate, and the average distance between the vertices, which we know how to calculate an average. So there's a couple of different ways of measuring the likelihood that a graph is a small world graph. Today, we're just going to be looking at the small world coefficient, but we'll put a link in the description if you're curious about the other ones. So for the small world coefficient, we divide the clustering coefficient of the suspected small world graph by the clustering coefficient of the random graph divided by the average distance between the vertices of the small world graph, divided by the average distance between the vertices of the random graph. To be a small world graph, sigma must be greater than one. And there's a couple different ways that this will happen. So our average distance between nodes for our small world graph is gonna be roughly equivalent to the average distance between nodes of our random graph because they have that equivalent density, which means our denominator is gonna be roughly equal to one. As for our numerator, well, if we suspect that something is a small world graph, it's probably going to have a very high clustering coefficient. While for a random graph, it's gonna be a much lower clustering coefficient, which means if we divide our suspected small world graph's clustering coefficient by our random graph's clustering coefficient, sigma should be greater than one, which meets that condition. So this is all cool. We know how to find out if a graph is a small world graph, but this can be a lot of work. So instead, what if we just want to have an algorithm that creates a guaranteed small world graph for us? There's actually a very cool way of doing this. We take a Watts-Drogatz model. The Watts-Drogatz model takes a random lattice graph, which I'm just about to show, and uses an algorithm in order to turn it into a small world graph. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a ring lattice with n vertices. In this case, we're choosing 12. And we will connect each vertice to k neighbors, which in this case, k is equal to 4. So we'll do this, and we'll connect each vertex to four of its nearest neighbors, like this. So now we have the next step, which is a little bit more complicated. So for each vertex, we're going to take every edge that connects it to its rightmost neighbor, and we're going to rewire it with probability p, which sounds super confusing when I say it out loud. So we'll run through several examples to kind of explain what we mean. So we'll start with zero we're going to take its rightmost neighbor and rewire it with probability p. So the rewiring is done, but this begs the question, what is p and what does it even mean? Well, rewiring is done by replacing 0, 10 with, let's say, 0, l, where l is chosen uniformly at random between all of the other vertices in the lattice. Keep in mind, we can't have duplicates or self-looping. Before I explain any more, it might help to do some more examples. Let's take one. So we've got one 11 and rewires it to one four. Now let's take two. We'll take two zero and rewire it to two eight. And we'll take three. So we've got three one and rewire it to three 11. So we kind of keep going on and on and on with every single vertex until we have something that looks sort of like this. Okay, so now you can see what the algorithm does, but why does this work? Well, remember earlier how I was talking about rewiring with probability p, where p is a number between 0 and 1 that represents the likelihood that an edge between two vertices is going to be rewired. Well, there's a really interesting thing that happens when we combine lattice graphs, which are extremely uniform, that have a probability of 0 because there's no rewiring, which when we combine it with something like a random graph that has a p equal to 1, where every single edge between a vertice has been rewired. And we get something like this graph, where p is somewhere in the middle between that 0 and 1. So this develops a small world graph because we get to have the best of both worlds. A lattice graph has a high clustering coefficient, where each vertex is connected to many of its neighbors, where a random graph has short path lengths on average. To explain a path length, we can kind of look at this graph here, where previously, in order to get from 8 to 2, we would have to take three different paths. Whereas now, because we have that shortcut, we only take one. So when we combine these two things, we get the best of both worlds, having that high clustering coefficient with short path length. Or in other words, we get a small world graph. So now you know how to create your very own small world graph. So why should you care? Well, whether it's looking at your friend group or neural networks or pandemics or supply chains, they're everywhere. 